so much for joining us today for our MEMS worship service online. We are so honored that you're tuning in from wherever you are and whatever may be going on in your life. We are so thankful that you're tuning in today and it is no accident that you're here. It is my prayer that as we worship, you will sense the presence of the Lord as well and that you will be drawn into his presence to worship him with us as we celebrate the Lord and what he has done for us. My prayer is that as we open the word of God, God will speak to your heart and whatever your needs are today, whatever it is that you may be going through in your life, that the Lord will speak a word right to your situation that will encourage you and allow you to know that Jesus truly does love you. It's our honor to have you joining with us online today. We want to invite you to participate and worship. Visit our website, memsbaptist.org. Follow us on all of our social media platforms. Maybe there's a prayer need that you have. You can communicate that with us and know that our staff and our church family takes that very seriously. And it would be an honor and a delight to join with you in prayer and praying with you about whatever your needs are. So again, from wherever you're watching, I want to just say thank you so much for giving us your time today. Welcome to Mims. God bless you. Welcome to worship. Let's all stand together. Hope you're having a great day today. Put our hands together this morning. Come all you weary. Come all you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water. Come and thirst no more. Come on now, sing it out, church. Come on, you sing. Come find His mercy, come to 
church, we need to put our hands together and celebrate that today. Somebody needs to shout out hallelujah. God so loved the world. We have been set free today. It is a joy to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Brother Michael, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. That's Looking a good song, good. huh? That's a good song. You yeah. guys did great. Yeah. Didn't they do a great job? Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house. The man in black. Are we doing Ring of Fire this morning? <laughs> Brother? We, we could, but On three. Not, not today. Just kidding. I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> Thank the Lord I'm not leading worship. Oh, uh, good to see y'all. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord together this morning? All right. It sure is. Uh, a few things for us. Our ushers are going to make their way forward, but while they're making their way forward, they're not going to start just yet because today is our fifth Sunday offering. You might say, well, it's not the fifth Sunday. It's not. It's not. But we're celebrating it today. Now, a couple of notes, though, about our fifth Sunday offering. First of all, it goes toward our Light Shine Fund, which helps us with uh, unexpected projects that might come up with the building or one day when we need to do a remodel of any sort. Um, it goes into that fund. Now, if you're using the regular fifth Sunday offering envelope, then we'll know that your offering is for fifth Sunday. If you happen to use our regular tithing envelopes, and it is for a fifth Sunday offering, just make a note on there, fifth Sunday, and we'll know. Otherwise, if it's not in one of these special envelopes or it's not noted on here, it just goes into our general fund. So just so you know, if your intention is to give to the fifth Sunday offering, then make sure you make a note of that so that um, our accounting folks know whenever they're going through it on Mondays, that's what it's for. So ushers, um, whenever you're ready to begin, please go ahead and do so. Hopefully that gave you a quick second if you needed it to get prepared for it. Let me remind you that next Sunday, February 19th, is our kind of mini revival Sunday. It's a, a harvest Sunday. We've got Brother Bill Britt here, both in the morning and again in the evening. And so I would say we're probably excited for the Super Bowl today. We're excited for the food. I'm excited for the food. But look, that's much bigger than the Super Bowl. Okay, having the gospel of Jesus Christ preached Sunday morning, Sunday night, bigger a million times over than the Super Bowl. So why don't you think today, think this week, if you've not already invited some people to join you next Sunday, who can I invite? Who can I bring with me next Sunday? And you all know, I know that Brother Bill Britt um, is anointed by the Lord to preach the word of God, especially when it comes to getting the gospel out there. And so I have incredible expectations that the Lord's going to move and speak through him. And we're going to see lives change next Sunday. And so uh, invite people, invite people this week to join you next Sunday. We've also got a lot of fun things going on in kids ministry, both Sunday morning and Sunday night next weekend as well. Um, speaking of kids ministry, kids choir is kicking off on March 5th. They're going to work toward a, a musical program on May 21st. Uh, but you can sign up today. You can sign up at Children's Ministry. This is for kindergarten through sixth grade. You can sign up at the Children's Ministry check-in area. You can also go online and sign up for that as well. So uh, Kids Choir, and I, I tell you, it, when you hear kids sing, uh, that's what heaven's going to sound like when you hear kids sing. And so if you um, know someone and you're like, you know what, their kids love to sing, that might be a, a great way to get them connected to the church, ask them. Say, we're starting up a kids choir. Why don't you, you come join us and be a part of that? And that'll be on Sunday nights, by the way, that they meet. Okay, last but not least, I'm about to show you a chart, a bar graph. That's the math teacher in me that just can't resist. Uh, but I'm about to show you a bar graph. Don't bring it up yet, please. Um, I've got to prepare myself because right now we have four teams. We have a red team. That's the choir. No fair. They have microphones and instruments. We've got the yellow team, that's Luke Chaddock's team, that's the uh, Friday night, that's the Saturday night team, the 4 p.m. Easter Saturday night team. They're not, that's not, they're not on your team, Luke, they're just cheering for you, okay. <sighs> Brother Larry, you had to go there with the Nolan Ryan jersey, the orange team. 
the Sunday morning, 8.30 a.m. team. And then, of course, the blue team, 10.30. Now, blue team, your cheering is great, but this graph says something different. Um, still, don't show it yet, because here's what I want to tell you. Here, here's the deal. Last Sunday, we had you get your phones out and text in to 936. And I want you to get your phone out right now. If you've not done this yet, get your phone out right now. You are allowed to get your phone out in church. Just make sure the ringer's off. And text in to the number 936-410-4449. If you're in the choir, you would text the word red. Just the word red. Not red and your dog's name. Not, re not red and your other favorite colors. Not red and your name. Just the word red. If you're going to the, to the Saturday night 4 p.m. service, yellow. Y-E-L-L-O-W. Yellow. If you're going to the Sunday morning 8.30 a.m. service, orange. And if you're coming to the Sunday morning 10.30 a.m. service, blue. Blue. By the way, we've got wristbands coming, and we'll all have color-coded wristbands so we can show everyone proudly what team we're on. And we're going to obviously run out of blue ones, but different story. But here's what you do. When you send in that keyword to that phone number, you should get uh, a text back. And it has a link. And what you do on that link is this. Every time you run across someone and you say, I want you to join me for Easter service, and, and you get a, a good feeling that they're not just kind of blowing you off. They're like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join you. I want to be your guest at Easter. Uh, so if you say, um, Luke Chaddock invites someone at Starbucks because he's, he's or Summer Moon, he, he loves. And, and he invites someone, he's going to go to that, that link and he's going to put in Luke Chaddock. And he, he probably invited five people. And he's going to type in five. That's it. What we're doing is we're building up the number of people that we're inviting for each of these service times. Now, if you invite them and you're going to a certain service time, it kind of makes sense that they would join you for that service time. But look, if we were all to show up on Sundays, all the folks who are here over the course of a month, we wouldn't have room. As a matter of fact, with three services, we're going to be pressed for space. That's a big, big big deal and it's not a problem it's a great thing we want to pack this place with people that we run across each and every day in our, our circles of life because people need the hope of Jesus Christ so when you invite them you're inviting them to join you to celebrate a risen Savior and we trust that that morning or that evening whenever they're here God's going to speak to hearts and he's going to transform eternities and so it's an it's a really big deal that we invite. It's not a small thing. So we're pressing each of us, myself included, to, to stretch ourselves. Over the next several weeks, we have these pep rally teams meeting. We're pressing ourselves to invite and then to hold ourselves accountable. Accountability is a big deal. If you're like me, if you don't have accountability, the path of least resistance is to, to say, well, it's, it's really not that important. This is important. We're talking uh, eternity in the balance for people we love. If we really love people, we're going to invite people. And so that's why we want to track the number of people we're inviting. So without further ado, bumpy start, blue team. Let me show you our first graph. And it's the only time blue is going to be behind. Yeah. Chris Thomas, control yourself. Orange team, the Lord loves you guys too. Okay, so next week, um, we're going to blow through that. That graph's going to look a lot different. And those are the, that's not who is coming, you who's texted in. That is how many we as a blue team, an orange team, a yellow team, a red team have invited. Does that make sense? If that makes sense, say, I get it. Okay, good. All right. That was a real long explanation, but it's setting the stage for us over the next several weeks as we push each other for some healthy kingdom competition to get more people here because we have the greatest thing of all to offer them, the G uh, hope of Jesus Christ, a risen Savior. 
Now, in just a second, we're going to celebrate with more baptisms. Aren't you excited that we're seeing baptisms each and every week? It's, it is awesome. It is awesome. The Lord's moving, and we are so grateful. And so let's go to him right now. Thank him, celebrate with baptisms, and continue worshiping together. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for what you are doing here. God, it's in spite of us, it's in spite of our shortcomings and, and all of our, our missteps. Lord, you are just good. You are good and you're great and you're holy and you're mighty and you're sovereign. And Lord, we know that so many people need the hope of Jesus. We're grateful for what your son has done for us and we say thank you. We lift up the name of Jesus this morning and we thank you that we can celebrate Celebrate eternities changed while witnessing these baptisms. God, we didn't do anything here. You did it. And so we say thank you. Lord, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do next weekend. We thank you for what you're going to do over the next several weeks as we work hard to invite people to join us for Easter. So this morning, we say thank you. We have great anticipation for all that's to come. Lord, speak through our pastor this morning. May we lift up sweet offerings of worship to you this morning, starting right here with baptism. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. That's what these young boys have just proclaimed today, that they are following Christ Jesus and building their lives on the solid rock. Let's worship the same God today, lifting our voices, lifting our hearts to him in worship.
together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but only trust in Jesus' name. from the dead and he is Lord let's sing it together he is Lord he is Lord oh declare it today he is risen he is risen from the dead and he
see you face to face were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be magnified oh let's magnify him today were the whole earth echoing his eminence his name would burst from sea and sky from rivers to the mountain tops we did rise be magnified come on now church every voice lift it up magnify the lord together oh christ be magnified let his praise arise christ be magnified That's our prayer today, that Christ would be magnified. When every creature finds its inmost melody, and every human heart its native cry, oh, then in one enraptured hymn of praise, we'll sing Christ be you Lord we choose to give you the glory you deserve now I won't bow down to idols I'll stand strong and worship you if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be born by feelings I'll hold fast to what is true if the cross brings transformation then I'll be crucified with you come on now cause death is just the doorway into resurrection life if I join you in your sufferings then I'll join you when you rise and when you
my soul rejoice. Oh, my soul rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. May that our worship would be a sweet, sweet sound to you today. God, that you would inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, we thank you that the presence of your spirit is here with us this morning, right here in this room. And Father God, I pray that you minister to every person, every need according to your perfect plan. Lord, you know exactly what everyone's dealing with today individually. And God, we're so thankful that you're a personal God, that you care about our personal and individual needs and God, for those that are going through a tough time today, Lord, I pray that you just remind them that you are holding their lives in the palm of your hands. Thank you, Father, that you never leave us and you never forsake us. You're with us at all times, even at this very moment right now. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated.
Would you uh, bow your heads with me and let's pray together today. Father, we love you and it is indeed an honor and a joy to be together in your house, to come before you and to worship you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can cast all of our care on you. We can trust you. We can rely upon you. Thank you that you're faithful. Thank you that you're on your throne. Thank you that regardless of what we do face, Lord, we can always lean on you. So speak to our heart today and give us exactly what we need, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark today and go to chapter 7, if you will. We, with the Lord's help, are going to conclude chapter 7 today. Mark chapter 7. I pray the Lord would give to every one of us in this room the excitement that those four boys I just baptized had. I'm telling you, the energy, if I could bottle it up, they were fired up and ready to go. All five were, but uh, spending time with those boys and talking to them today, I'm just so thankful they didn't do a cannonball and get me wet. Amen? <clears throat> Mark chapter 7. Hey, Brother Ainsley is 97 years old this weekend. During the Christmas uh, fellowship for their class, uh, Julie and I went, and Julie uh, sang that day, and he walked over to me, and he said, when you start preaching as good as she's singing, we'll have revival. Amen? (laughs) Brother Ainsley, I love you, and what a blessing, and I thank the Lord for you. We're going to get happy today in church. Amen. Mark chapter 7, verse 31. Mark chapter 7, verse 31. And again, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, He came into the Sea of Galilee through the middle of the coast of Decapolis. They bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. They beseech him to put his hand upon him. He took him aside from the multitude. He put his finger into his ears and he spit and touched his tongue. Now, let me ask a question. Would you agree with me that has to be one of the most odd and peculiar things in the Bible? Yes or no? Uh, Who wants to know why he uh, put his finger in his ears, spit, and touched his tongue? Who wants to know? Who wants it? I don't have a clue. I mean, I really don't. I have searched. I, I'm going to make a confession. I have prayed and I have searched all week long for something that is so deep uh, as to why he would spit and touch his tongue. And, and I was just, you know, I don't have a clue. I don't know. But I know this. If you ask me to pray for you, I'm not going to spit. And, and I'm not going to put my finger in your ear. Can I get a witness from anyone? <laughs> and so looking up to heaven, he sighed. He said unto them, Ephpatha. That is, be opened. It's obvious the guy was uh, not a Gentile. Uh, Straightway his ears were open. The string of his tongue was loosed. He spake plainly. He charged them that they should tell no man, but the more he charged them, so much more, a great deal they published. Isn't that just like us? Maybe what we ought to do is we ought to say to you, don't you tell a soul about Easter. Don't you dare tell anyone. Maybe, I don't know. It, it, Jesus told them not to say a word, and they could not stop telling it. And they were beyond measure astonished, and they said, now watch this. He has done all things well. Can you say that today in your life? He makes both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. Mark 7 is an interesting progression, if you will follow it. Last week we looked at verses 24 through 30 where Jesus left the area where he spent the bulk of his ministry, especially in the Gospel of Mark, in the Sea of Galilee area, and he traveled north about 30 to 40 miles to a Gentile area to two port cities on the Mediterranean Sea. He traveled to Tyre and Sidon. They would be located in modern-day Lebanon. And here he goes, and he enters a home, verse 24, and as he does, enters a lady who had a great need. Her daughter, her young daughter, was with a devil, and she comes to the Lord, and she requests of him that he would set her daughter free. And so he tells her, if you remember, to go your way, and by the time she makes it back home, her daughter is on the bed and is resting and is well. Today we're going to continue, and we're going to discover the next encounter that our Lord has. Isn't it interesting to just trace the footsteps of Jesus and to trace the different encounters that he had with people? Aren't you still thankful that even today the Lord is still encountering people? Is anyone grateful for that? The miracle we're going to look at today and the encounter we're going to look at as we conclude chapter 7 with the Lord's help is only two recorded miracles that is only found in the Gospel of Mark and nowhere else. This one we've already pointed out is a little interesting in the sense of the method that he would use in order to set this man free. 
First of all, I want to call your attention to the route. It may seem insignificant at first glance, but when you dig a little deeper, it's real interesting to see what's going on in verse 31. Jesus has encountered this woman. He has set her daughter free. And now, verse 31 says, departing from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, he came into the Sea of Galilee through the middle of the coast of Decapolis. Now, Decapolis, uh, some would say Decapolis, Decapolis was an interesting region. It was a capital city of 10 particular cities that were in that area and in that region. The first time you see our Lord travel there is in the Gospel of Mark uh, earlier in chapter 5. He had just taught them in parables in chapter 4. And in chapter 5, he tells them to get into the boat. We're going to the other side. And as they make it to the other side, they encounter a man who was demon-possessed. The man was set free, and we're told in Mark 5, he was seated and clothed and in his right mind, and he had a desire to go and be with the Lord and accompany the Lord. But the Lord said, no, you're not able to accompany me, but rather I want you to go to your friends and go to your family, and I want you to publish to them and announce to them the great things that I have done for you. And the Bible concludes in that passage with saying that that man, we call him Legion, after he was set free, goes throughout Decapolis and he begins to publish and announce the great things the Lord has done. And the Bible says all men did marvel. Now notice the path, if you will. They're leaving Tyre and they're going back to Jewish territory. Certainly you understand that they were north of the territory where they had just left, so it would make sense, would it not, that they would turn back around and go back south. But instead, what did they do? They leave and they go 20 miles north to Sidon, and then they go through the middle of Decapolis. What I'm trying to get you to understand is they're going the wrong way. They're going the long way. They're going out of the way, and they're taking what should have been about a 25 to 30-mile journey on foot, and they're turning it into a 70-mile journey on foot. It leads me to the purpose. Why is this significant? Number one, it implies devotion. Jesus was trying to spend some time with the disciples. How many of you would have liked to have been in that company with Peter, James, and John and the others here following the Lord and tracing his footsteps, hearing him as he taught? Is anyone in the room looking forward to the day when we get to glory and we can have uninterrupted communion and fellowship with the King of kings and Lord of lords? Amen. Man, I'm so thankful for the reports I'm reading and hearing of revival that's breaking out. God, bring another awakening to this country. And I don't want to be a negative Nancy, but I want to just say one thing that I cannot understand. I appreciate the reports out of Asbury. I'm for it. God move. God let it multiply. But for the life of me, I can't understand why people would go to be in the presence of God and pull their cell phone out and record it. I'm telling you, if Jesus showed up in this house, I hope we'd have enough sense to put our phone up and bask in the presence of God. And one of the problems with us today is, I mean, have you noticed it? LeBron James broke the scoring record this week. And do you know what people were doing that paid $60,000 for a ticket instead of enjoying the moment? And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, one of the reasons we can't have revival is because we're so attuned to everything else. Put your phone down, pull up a chair in the presence of God, and let God speak to you and just bask in his glory. Amen? Now, don't go listen to what I'm not saying and get all ugly and mad and upset. If you hear my heart, I believe God wants to bring an awakening. I want to get in on it. I want to be a part of the solution, yes or no. But I'm just telling you, isn't his presence enough? I wouldn't want to miss a thing to pull out my phone and see what's going on on Facebook. Sit down. Be quiet. Be in the presence of the Lord. Let him move. And Jesus says, come on, boys. We're going to spend some time together. And he brings them 50 miles out of the way, and he travels back down, and he goes right into the middle of Decapolis, a place that he had left previously. Why did he bring them back there? Well, do you remember when he was there in Mark 5? Do you remember when uh, he cast the demon out of Legion, and they went into the swine, and the swine went down into the water? Do you remember what the locals in that crowd did? They ran him off. They wanted him gone. And Jesus left that witness who went and started reporting all throughout the region the great things the Lord had done, and now Jesus is giving it some time, and he's going 
going right back to where he was. Why? For another opportunity to witness. See, that's why the Lord's left us here, ladies and gentlemen, to be a witness with the Lord. Don't overlook the route. It was, it was significant. It was not accidental. It was providential. And let me just apply it to your life before we move on. How many times do you feel like these disciples taking the long way? God leads you all the way around the world to get you from point A to point B, and you question God and wonder where is he, and yet he's on time. It's not coincidental or accidental. It's providential. God knows what he's doing. Amen? And when you feel like you're going out of the way to travel north, to turn around and go back south, and you question God, remember when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart, never doubt in the dark what God tells you in the light. When God's leading you, listen, he's leading you on the right path. He knows what he's doing. Secondly, I want you to notice the restriction. Look at verse 32. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they beseech him to put his hand upon him. Now, verse 32 introduces us to a man who had a double problem. He was deaf, and according to Scripture, he had difficulty speaking. Notice the restriction in this man's life. Notice his problem. He was deaf. Now, when you study that word deaf, it's an interesting word. It is a very unique word. It is a word that means dull, dull or it means to blunt. And the implication, there's no way we can back this up biblically, but the indication is somewhere along the line he had an injury. And so what many Bible scholars think about this man is that he was born able to hear, but somewhere along the line he had an injury perhaps that now made it impossible for him to hear. And we're told in verse 32 of this problem that he was deaf and he had an impediment. It was difficult for him to speak. It does not say he could not speak. It was difficult for him to speak. In other words, he was stuttering. He was stammering. Now, miracles in your Bible, when you study them, in the physical realm, reveal to us what Jesus can do in the spiritual realm. Who in the house knows that Jesus Christ can open deaf ears, blind eyes? He can open a closed tongue that it can sing praise to the Lord. You see, the spiritual implication for this, for you and for me, is this. Outside of Jesus, we're spiritually deaf, spiritually blind, and we're spiritually mute. We're not able to say a word. Who in the room is thankful that the Lord Jesus spiritually is able to open our ears, open our heart, open our eyes? Hey, you could be deaf, but in heaven, you'll be able to hear the praise of Jesus. You may be blind, but in heaven, you'll be able to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Fanny Crosby was once asked, would you like your eyesight back? And she answered, absolutely not. When pressed, here's what she said, because when I die and go to heaven, I want the first face that I see to be that of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. You may have perfect vision. You may be able to hear perfectly. But if you're outside of Christ, you're spiritually blind and you're spiritually deaf. And you need a miracle that is even greater than deaf ears being open. Can our God do it? In fact, he can. But I'm here to tell you, if you spiritually are outside of Christ, you need your ears open that you can hear the glory of the Lord. You need your eyes open that you can see him for who he is. Is anyone in the house listening today? Say amen. amen. Now, there was the problem, but notice the people, verse 32. Jesus comes to town, and guess what they do? They start running from everywhere. I was thinking about this. If an athlete comes to town, oh, my goodness gracious, people come from far and wide to talk to the athlete. We want his autograph or her autograph. We want a picture. We want to be able to talk to him. We want to be able to see him. If a singer comes to town, good night almighty, all of the people go cray-cray, especially in Montgomery County, and especially if it's a country singer. They get those wranglers out, and they starch them. I mean, they could just stand up on their own, yes or no? <laughs> yes or no? I see more would-be pretend cowboys when I go to the rodeo to get my fried butter and my fried cheesecake and all my fried food. I see more would-be cowboys than I've ever seen in my life. And they've got those wranglers so tight. I'm telling you, if a quarter was in their back pocket, you could tell if it were heads or tails a mile away. <laughs> like a rhinestone cowboy, yes or no? Can I get a witness from anyone in the house? Boy, singer come to town, folks go crazy. Some of you go crazy. Some of you in the room go absolutely stark raving mad. You let a singer come to town and it brings people out. I'll tell you what else I've learned in Montgomery County. You let a politician come to town, woo, good night almighty, the people go crazy. I cannot tell you how many invitations I get nearly on a weekly basis to come hear this politician or to come get this uh, particular person, meet this person or whatever. And, and you know, Think, okay, fine, but you just get to a point where it just gets old. Who knows what I'm talking about? 
And so it's amazing to watch how people respond when certain people come to town. But on this day, when Jesus came to town, let me tell you what the people did. They knew a healer was in their midst. They knew God in human flesh was there. And they run to this man, and the Bible says that they gather him, and they bring him, and they beckon the Lord, and they beg the Lord, would you touch him, and would you do something? I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, if every one of us in the room would have our eyes open to who Jesus is, we would do everything that we could to roll up our sleeves and get every single solitary person that we can to the feet of Jesus. We can't open their ears. We can't open their eyes. We can't save them. But we can get them to the miracle worker. And once we get him to the miracle worker, he can step in and do what no man can do, no church can do, no preacher can do, no politician can do, no singer can do, no actor can do, no government can do. Jesus Christ can set you free from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet and if we would be enamored in who he is and overwhelmed and overcome with who he is we would go out of our way to do whatever it takes to get every man woman boy or girl to the feet of Jesus well there's the restriction thirdly who's still listening say amen let's talk about the remedy let's try to figure all this out best we can verse 33 he takes him aside from the multitude puts his finger in his ear spits and touches his tongue what do you think that man thought <laughs> I should probably keep most of my thoughts to myself, but that crowd worried about COVID. They wouldn't have liked that. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Put his finger in his ear. He didn't observe six feet separation. <laughs> well, I mean, you want to be healed? Yes or no? So looking up to heaven, he sighs, he says to him, be opened. Straightway his ears were opened, the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plainly. Notice the remedy. Now I want you to notice the separation. See, this crowd got their friend to Jesus, but once they got their friend to Jesus, it was no longer their business. It was now between Jesus and this man. And because he loved this man, he did not want to make him a public spectacle, and he moved him away over to the side. The man was not able to hear, and so he did not want the man distracted. He wanted his focus fully on him. So he takes this man that's deaf and has difficulty speaking, and he brings him to the side, away from the crowd, away from the multitude, because you could rest assured, you could take it to the bank. If he would have done this in front of the crowd, they would have made a spectacle of this man. And just as I described a few minutes ago, if this were modern day, can you see all of the people going live to let everyone know we're reporting to you from Conroe. Jesus has a man pulled to the side. And I mean, we just have to know. Inquiring minds want to know. I'm glad to know the Lord doesn't announce all of our business to the world. I'm glad the Lord works with us individually. Is anyone thankful for that? And he takes the man and he pulls him to the side. There's separation. Notice the sign. Now, when you study the Bible, let's do the best we can to explain what's going on here. When you study the Bible, you will discover there are at least 38 recorded miracles in the four Gospels. It's interesting to note that Jesus was always very careful to never repeat and duplicate the same method when he performed a miracle. I mean, when you take people, for example, whose blinded eyes were open, Jesus would do it and handle it in different ways. Sometimes he would speak authoritatively to them. On one occasion, do you remember, uh, he scooping, took some mud, put it in a man's eyes, said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And boy, there's a lot we could say about that because that clay is a symbol of the Word of God. You get something in your eye, it irritates you. And the Word of God brings deep conviction in our heart that causes us to want to obey the command of the Lord. You see, Jesus would perform miracles, but he was careful to use different methods when performing the miracles. Why? Because had he not, our focus would have been on the method of the miracle and not the master of the miracle. Ladies and gentlemen, let's see if we can get on the same page. Who in this room believes that Jesus can take a man who is deaf and open his ears where he can hear? And who believes Jesus can take a man who has difficulty speaking and loose his tongue where he could speak? Who believes that? But I'm telling you, our focus should not be on the method or even on the miracle. It should be on Jesus. Adrian Rogers said before he went to heaven, believe in miracles, but trust in God. I know some people that worship miracles. I know some people that deny them. I'm telling you, whether you believe it or not, our God is a miracle work in God. But don't run around focusing on fingers and ears, spit on finger, touch and tongue. Focus on the one in the house that is bigger than deaf ears 
and can open them. Amen? So Jesus used different methods. Now, why in the world did he put his finger in his ear? And why in the world did he do this? This is the best I can come up with. If you can do it better, let me know. You ready? Jesus was pulling this deaf man to the side. And he was about to show him what he was going to do. And he put his finger in his ear to say, I'm about to open your ear. And I'm about to loose your tongue. It was a sign for the man that I'm about to touch you and set you free. Do you see the compassion of the Lord, yes or no? Do you see the love of the Lord that brings him to the side, away from the crowd, not to make a spectacle of him, and to show him, this is what I'm about to do for you? Boy, our Savior is so good. Now notice verse 34, the source. Do you see what he does now? He looks up to heaven. Wait a minute. Put yourself in the shoes of the deaf man. Jesus grabs you and brings you to the side. Who's following me today? Who's listening? Say amen. He takes the deaf man, pulls him to the side. Watch this. He's looking at him face to face. Jesus is. He puts his finger in his ear, puts his finger on his tongue, and watch what Jesus does. He looks up to heaven as if to show this man the source for what's about to happen is from above. Boy, that, that, that'd make a Baptist shout like a Pentecostal. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Maybe a few of you. I don't know. I'm not really sure. I mean, do you see what Jesus, does anyone get this? Maybe I'm the only one blessed by this. Jesus loves this man so much. He touches his ear to show him what he's about to do. Touches his tongue to show him what he's about to do. And watch this. He looks up to show this man, my father is the source for all good things. I'll tell you what else. It shows me and you, the more we get connected to him, the more we'll care about people. You see, compassion is directly linked to being rightly related to the Father. Preacher, how can I have more compassion? Look to heaven, and when you look to heaven, you'll look to others. Jesus is touching him in his point of need. And ladies and gentlemen, we've got to go and touch people at their point of need. My goodness gracious, all we've heard the past week is apparently something happened on the Grammys. Well, I don't watch the Grammys, so I wouldn't have known what would have happened had all the Christians not been sharing pictures of the devil. Amen? I'm gonna, can I make a prediction? May I make a prediction? Yes, Brother Jerry, you may make a prediction. May I make a prediction? May I make a prediction? There's going to be a halftime show tonight, and it's going to be wicked. I know that before it starts. I don't condone it. I don't like it. But you know what? The only surprise is you're surprised. This is not a gospel concert tonight. I've never understood why Christians lose their minds over lost people acting like lost people. Do you understand what I'm saying? I can't understand why folks want to pretend that they're worshiping the devil, but the fact that you're surprised actually kind of blows my mind a little more. In other words, it's wicked, it's debauchery, I don't like it, but quit giving it time. Y'all remember a couple of years ago, apparently, in a halftime show in the Super Bowl, there were two women that were half naked. For two weeks, every lady in America, almost, kept sharing that picture again and again and again and again and again. And I thought, I didn't watch the halftime show. I have to look at half-naked women because you keep sharing it. If you'd stop sharing it, we'd stop talking about it. Yes or no? So let me just tell you, before you lose yourself tonight and go on a tirade, that the Super Bowl is not meant to worship our Lord and Savior. Amen? I wish both teams could lose. I don't like either one of them. When the New Orleans Saints make it, then I'll be for it. But until then, it's of the devil. Can I get a witness? Amen? So I'm going to eat. I'm going to enjoy my family. And I'm not going to lose myself over a halftime show that I already know is going to be wicked before it starts. Amen. Amen. The lost world's wicked. You're wicked. I'm wicked. And were it not for the blood of Jesus, we'd be right there doing what they do. Amen. Yes or no? So don't you dare think I'm condoning it or approving of it because I'm not. But what I am saying is quit acting shocked that we live in a dark, pagan, wicked world. And instead, we ought to be more shocked at the dullness 
of churches across our country that needs Holy Ghost fire and needs revival. And may we run to the Lord Jesus with all of our heart and seek him like never before. Well, I just had to get a little preaching out today. Just makes me feel better. And you watch. They've already got the articles ready. It'll all, it, within an hour, within 30 minutes, worst halftime show I've ever seen. Wicked, 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 wicked. And you just are just going to, I'm going to have to take a social media break to get away from the crazy people. All right, there you go. Amen? Now, what's the point? The source is he looks to heaven. He was showing this man the source of healing was coming from his father. Ladies and gentlemen, when we're rightly related to the Father, we'll have a broken heart for people. I mean, the Son of God took this man to the side, put his finger in his ears, finger on his tongue, looked to heaven. Now watch this next principle. It's real interesting. It's a sign of sympathy. He had sympathy on the man. Verse 34 says he sighed. He groaned. Now let me ask you a question. Did he groan so that man could hear him? Oh, well, I don't know if you've forgotten. He was deaf. He could not hear him. Jesus groaned, and it was an inward groaning because of compassion for this man. You see, when you look to heaven and acknowledge him, and then you look at people, your heart will break. My heart breaks for people that thinks it's funny to worship the devil. My heart breaks. My heart grieves for people that think that's cute to know what he will do to a life. He cares nothing for you. He will destroy you and destroy your family and destroy your children and laugh at you while he does it. And our heart ought to be broken for a culture around us who thinks it's child's play and it's cute. But the more we acknowledge who God is and we're rightly related to him, the more we'll become aware of the needs of those that are around us. Notice the speaking, verse 34. Who's still listening? Say amen. Amen. So he looks to heaven, he sighs, he looks at the source, he sighs, and he says to him, he speaks to him, and the command is, be opened. Aren't you thankful there's power in the Word of God? Aren't you thankful there's power in the Word of God? I'm going to ask it again. Aren't you thankful there's power in the Word of God? And so he speaks to him, and he, he says, open up. And the Bible says the supernatural happened immediately at once, immediately at once, he could hear, he could speak. There's power in the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Do you know Jesus raised three people from the dead in the Bible? I know we would think there's more, but only three. And do you know on all three occasions, he did the same thing? (laughs) Even though I told you earlier, he never used the same method. Whenever he raised someone from the dead, he used the same method. He'd walk over to the dead body, and he spoke to the dead body as if the dead body could hear him. And he said, for example, in one occasion, Luke 7, young man, I say to you, arise. Who remembers Lazarus? Do you remember the story of Lazarus in John 11? And he says, Lazarus, come forth. Through the word of Jesus, there is resurrection power. Through the word of Jesus, dead things come back to life. Is there anyone grateful to know that nothing can stay dead in the presence of Jesus? Is there anyone thankful to know that through the word of Jesus, there is resurrection power? Is there anyone excited to know that dead things come to life through the word of the Lord Jesus Christ? There is resurrection power in the word of the Lord. There is resurrection power in the word of the Lord. There is resurrection power in the word of the Lord. And Jesus speaks to dead things and they come alive. Through the authority of Jesus and through the word of Jesus, deaf ears are made to hear. Tongue that cannot speak is made to speak. Dead things come alive. Hallelujah for the supernatural power of the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Well, let me give you the final thing. Who's still awake? Say amen. Amen. I want you to notice the reply, verse 36 and 37. Now, notice the demand. He charges them. He commands them that they should tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more he commanded him, so much the more a great deal. They published it. They announced it. Jesus said to them, he demanded of them, don't say a word. And yet the more he said, the more he spoke, the more he demanded, the more they began to speak. And then I want you to notice the declaration. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, this ought to be our testimony in this room. And this is what we should be excited about. Here it is. And they were beyond measure astonished. They were overwhelmed. And they said, watch this, he has done all things well. Would you say that out loud with me, church? Here it is. He has done all things well. Say it again. He has done all things well. One more time. He has done all things well. Oh, I got a question for you. 
Can you look back over your life and reflect and declare today, he's done all things well? Have there ever been times in your life when you didn't understand what was going on? Has there ever been anyone in this room, your back's been against the wall at the midnight hour, you didn't know how you were going to pay that bill, you didn't know where food was going to come from, you didn't know how you were going to survive? I mean, I'm just asking, is there anyone in the house that knows what I'm talking about? You didn't know how you were going to get through, you didn't know how you were going to make it, you didn't know what was going to happen to your family, you didn't know what was going to happen to your marriage, but you look back over your life right now and you reflect over the goodness of God and you exclaim today, He has done all things well. He has done all things well. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, life is best understood looking backwards. Life is best understood when you've gone through some stuff and you look back over it and you see the hand of God and the handiwork of God and the faithfulness of God and the reality that God is on his throne. He has done all things well. 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 Amen. And he will always continue. He will never fail. He will prevail. He's on his throne. He's in charge. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. I joked with you last week and said I preach till I'm hungry. When I was baptized and I told the folks up there, I'm starving. They said this will be a short message. Maybe shorter message. Let me ask you a question today, ladies and gentlemen. Are you willing to look to the Lord and as you look to the Lord acknowledge the needs of others? with a compassionate heart, with a broken heart, with a sincere heart, love overflowing for other people because you care for them because of the heart of the Father that absolutely transforms your heart? Are you willing to look back over your life and say, He has done all things well? I'm telling you, He has done all things well. He will take care of you. He will meet your needs. He's in charge. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment, please? Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. And let's just pray together and ask the Lord to speak to our heart. Can we do that today? Who in the room today would say, Preacher, there has been a time in my life when I have trusted Jesus. I know that I'm a child of God. I know that I'm saved. I I know that I'm going to heaven. I know that Jesus Christ has transformed my life. And if I died, I know that I'd go to heaven, not because of anything I've done, all because of what he's done. If that's your testimony, would you slip your hand in the air as a testimony to the Lord? God bless you. You can put your hand down. Secondly, who in the room that just raised their hand would say, Preacher, I know the Lord, but if I'm being honest, I need His touch today. My need may not be for deaf ears to be opened, but I've got some spiritual needs in my life and only the Lord can provide. And uh, I need Him to touch me today. I need Him to reach down and touch me right now. If that's you, would you slip your hand in the ear and just be honest? Would you do that? God bless you people. Next, two in the room would say, Preacher, I've got some family and some loved ones who are in a desperate situation just like this man. Spiritually, they're deaf, they're blind. Spiritually, they need the Lord's touch. And I want to do like this crowd did. I want to do all I can and everything that I can to as quickly as I can get them to Jesus. I want to have a heart of desperation and I want to look to heaven to acknowledge the source as the Father so that as I look to Him, my heart will express compassion and kindness to a world around me that is hurting and that is in need and that is desperate of the Lord's touch. Is there a mom or a dad? Is there a family member today that would say, Preacher, pray for me. I've got family and friends. They need to get to the feet of Jesus. And I'm desperate. And I want to get them to Him. Would you slip your hand in the air? Would you do that? God bless you. Let me ask you this. Do you really believe he can touch them? Do you really believe he can change them? Do you really believe we pray to that kind of God that is more than able? He is able. He is able. He is able. And maybe today there are others in the room that as you just reflect over the path of your life and the journey of your life, it seems like there have been times where the Lord's confused. Lord, why are we going north when we should be going south? And maybe you've even questioned in that way. But as you live through it and as you walk through it, you can testify and exclaim today, He does all things well. What a God. What a God. He is able. Maybe today there are those in this room that would say, Preacher, I'm like this man. Spiritually. Spiritually. I need the Lord. There's never been a time when I've trusted Him and there's never been a time when I put my faith and 
hope and confidence in him. And today I want to give my life to him. Jesus Christ, God's only son on an old rugged cross died for you. He gave his life for you. He shed his blood for you. He was buried in a borrowed tomb and arose on the third day. And he's mighty to save. And if you've never put your trust in him today, you can. We're going to take just a few moments and have what we call a time of response, a time of invitation. I say this, I think, probably every week. There's nothing magical about walking an aisle or kneeling at an altar. But there is something very powerful about just obeying God when He speaks to your heart. And maybe today your need is for a touch from the Lord, or maybe your need is for a family member to be brought to the feet of Jesus so that He can take them to the side and He can handle the situation. The Bible says we have not because we ask not. And yeah, it's true, we don't get everything we ask for. But I'll tell you this, I don't want to do without because I don't ask. And so maybe today you want to come to an altar and pray by yourself or with family, or maybe you want to come pray for someone, or maybe you need someone to pray for you or pray with you or talk with you. We'll have some people here in a minute to pray for you. Maybe today you're just desperate. You need the Lord. You're, you're, you just need His touch. Maybe today you're one that would say, I need to be saved. I need Jesus. I don't need religion. I need a relationship with the Lord Jesus. And I want to give my life to Him today. Brother Allen's going to sing. We're going to worship. The altars are open. People will be here right now praying. They're going to get in their place. And I want to ask you and I want to encourage you. Listen, however the Lord's leading you and speaking to you, you just do what He says. Come and pray. Come have people pray for you. Come pray for others. Come pray for yourself. Let's trust Him as we stand to our feet and as we sing. I know, Lord, Your plan for me is right. And I need You to fulfill I submit to you, my King. Be my everything. I'm coming to you again. Lord, here I
it's such a privilege, Lord, just to come and to lift up your name and to have you speak to our heart. And uh, God, I ask you to meet every single need. I'm so thankful to be able to study today the fact that you take a person and you bring them to the side and you meet them right at their point of need. I thank you, Lord, that you deal with us as individuals and you know how to individually meet our individual needs. And Lord, it's so awesome just to to consider today that here was a man that was deaf and he needed your touch and you met him right where he was. And Lord, you know every hurt in this room, you know every ache, you know every pain, you know every disappointment. And Lord, you're, uh, you're near to us. You're near, your word says, you're near to the brokenhearted. And I'm asking you in the name of Jesus for your glory to meet every specific need in this room. I'm thankful that there's nothing in this room, not one single thing that's too big for you. There's not one single thing that's outside of your reach and your grasp. You're able, you're more than able. And your word says you can do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. You're the God, Lord, that speaks to dead things and they come alive. You're the God that speaks to dry bones and they come back together. And so, Lord, I'm asking you for your glory and honor to meet every need in this room, to heal every hurt, to minister to every individual. We love you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness. Have your way. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said amen. Again, I want to say thank you for joining us today online, for participating in the worship. I hope and pray the Lord spoke to your heart, ministered to you, and helped you today by your tuning in. We want you to know we appreciate you. We want you to know that we consider you a part of our family and of the household of faith known as MIMS. So thank you again for tuning in today. Listen, if there's ever anything we can pray with you about, we want you to reach out to us. You can go to our website, memsbaptist.org. You can follow us on social media, and we would love to hear from you and to know how the Lord is speaking to you, how we can encourage you, how we can help you, how we can walk through this thing called life together. The Lord is so good and is so faithful. But before we go, I just simply want to say to you, Jesus is Lord. He loves you and he gave his life for you. He died, he was buried, and he arose again. And if you have never fully trusted Him, even today, you can call on Him and surrender your life to Him. If that's something you're struggling with or if you have questions, feel free to reach out to our church. We'd love to pray with you to answer questions and to communicate with you how you can begin a walk with Jesus yourself. You're special to us. We appreciate you. Thank you again for tuning in to our MIMS online family. We look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you.